Hello there, Physically Debunked here, and welcome to the first video in a series where I'll be debunking the most famous short arguments for God's existence. The cosmological argument, the design argument, the ontological argument, and others besides these are all well-known proofs of God's existence that are expressed in just a few lines of reasoning. These arguments often rely on some intuitively obvious feature of the world, and then seek to show that the existence of an omnipotent deity is the only plausible explanation for these features. Now, while I'll readily admit that these arguments have intuitive appeal, by all estimations, they do fall short of what they're trying to prove. An argument is only as good as its premises. Like a house of cards, if any one premise is unsound, the whole argument collapses. That's why in this series of videos, I'll be analysing each and every premise of these arguments and asking whether they truly stand up to scrutiny. Do these arguments really get anywhere near proving the existence of God? First up is the Kalam cosmological argument, probably the most well-known simple argument for God's existence, thanks to William Lane Craig's tireless defence of it. In its modern form, the argument runs like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. Now on its own, this argument isn't a proof of God's existence. All it attempts to show is that the universe has a cause. To prove God's existence then, apologists append a further argument, and we'll take a look at this in a future video. For now though, let's just have this three-line argument in mind. In this video, we're going to discuss the first premise. Is it plausible that whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. Theologians such as Lane Craig have claimed that this first premise is self-evidently true, that it's utterly irrefutable. And to be fair to them, it certainly does seem to hold when applied to everything we encounter in our daily lives. If you see an egg in a bird's nest, a car on the road, or a painting in a museum, you know both that all these things began to exist and that they all have a cause for their existence. There was a bird that laid the egg, a manufacturer that made the car, and an artist who painted the painting. If you try and think of an everyday scenario that violates this first premise, nothing comes to mind. Theologians are certainly correct to assert that on the face of it, this premise is extremely plausible. But here's the thing, this premise isn't just about everyday objects, it's a statement about everything. This premise claims that any object that begins to exist, no matter how exotic, has a cause for its existence. If we take a look at the whole of the cosmological argument for a second, we can see that ultimately it wants to apply this first premise to the universe as a whole. Now, our local patch of the universe may seem like an ordinary object, but this argument wants to talk about the universe in its entirety, which is clearly not just an everyday object. So if the cosmological argument is going to be successful, we need to be sure that this first premise is really true about every object in existence, and not just the everyday ones we see around us. So we need to take a closer look at whether this first premise is really a general truth. What reasons do we have to think that this premise applies to all things and not just eggs, cars and paintings? One possible reason we could have is an inductive reason. Inductive reasoning is where we accept a general law based on a finite number of particular instances, which seem to confirm it. It's argued that because every object we've ever encountered obeys the first premise, the first premise is inductively verified, and so we should accept it. Everything that we've witnessed come into existence has had a cause for its existence, and so this is evidence for the general law that whatever comes into existence has a cause. Apologists assert that this instance of inductive reasoning is totally justified, since this kind of reasoning is often used in science. If it works for science, then it should work for the first premise too. But here's the thing, induction doesn't always work. Suppose you were a physicist living before the development of quantum theory, wondering whether the statement, every object has an exact position in space, was true. To a pre-quantum physicist, everything in their experience would have confirmed this statement. Look at anything around you, it looks like it has an exact location. By induction, a pre-quantum physicist would have to accept this as a true law. But this would be an example of induction leading you astray. Now that quantum theory has been developed, 
We know that it isn't true that all objects have an exact position. Small things like atoms and electrons don't have well-defined positions in space. The statement, every object has an exact position in space, is wrong. What this tells us is that a rule that's true for every object we've dealt with so far might not be true in more extreme cases. So what does this mean for the first premise of the cosmological argument? It means that while we can be pretty sure that the premise is true for everyday objects, we have to be very careful about applying it to extreme cases. And without a doubt, the entire universe is an extreme case. If we want to be sure that we can apply this premise to absolutely everything, then we're going to need a better reason than an inductive one based on everyday objects. A different approach is to argue that the first premise has to be true, because its negation would lead to absurdities, a reductio ad absurdum. If it isn't true that everything that begins to exist has a cause, then wouldn't we see objects randomly popping into existence all the time? Surely the fact that we don't see this proves that the first premise is true. The problem with this argument, however, is that it's falsely assuming that if something can violate the first premise, then anything can. Even if the first premise isn't true for everything, that doesn't mean it isn't true for some things. The reason we don't see beach balls or buildings randomly popping into existence all the time is because the first premise is probably true for objects such as these. By negating the first premise, we're not saying that anything can begin to exist uncaused, but only that there may well be some exceptions that we don't know about because these exceptions aren't part of our everyday experience. We can accept that the first premise is true for most objects without accepting that it's true for the universe as a whole. Is there anything absurd about supposing that the universe is an exception to the first premise? Not obviously. Even if the first premise did apply to everything within the universe, but not to the universe itself, there are plausible reasons why this could be the case. The concept of causation is closely tied with the concepts of space and time. Perhaps all objects that exist inside the universe must obey the first premise, since they're located within space and time, but the universe as a whole is the totality of space and time, and not located within it. So it may be that the concept of causation simply doesn't apply to the universe, and that's why it's an exception to the first premise. Since the universe is fundamentally different to any object within it, there isn't anything absurd about supposing that there are rules that apply to things within the universe that don't apply to the universe as a whole. Are there any objects we know of that do violate the first premise? What's interesting is that there are some extreme cases where the first premise does seem to fail, or at least it doesn't seem obviously true. Virtual particles in quantum field theory appear to pop in and out of existence at random, without any identifiable cause for their existence. Whether these virtual particles really exist, though, is somewhat controversial. But what's undeniable is that the physical effects of these things can be measured. This suggests that these things really are there. And in quantum field theory, these virtual particles are not caused by anything in particular. A similar thing can be said for the decay of a radioactive nucleus. What causes the existence of the radioactive products? There doesn't seem to be an obvious answer to this question since radioactive decay is a fundamentally random process. There are no sufficient conditions that will force a radioactive decay to happen, and so it's very difficult to identify a cause for the existence of the radiation produced. One final misconception I've noticed is that some apologists seem to think that the first premise is a necessary law of nature, akin to the law of energy conservation in physics. Objects that begin to exist must have a cause because this is a fundamental law of nature. This claim, however, is ill-founded. In physics, you can quite readily prove why energy is conserved in certain systems, using a theorem called Noether's theorem. There is no similar construction, though, for the first premise. The terms begins to exist and cause aren't even well-defined fundamental concepts in physics, which they would have to be for the first premise to be a real law of nature. So there's nothing in physics that demonstrates that the first premise is a necessary law of nature. We've now discussed all the key arguments in favour of the first premise. So let's wrap things up. How has the first premise of the cosmological argument fared? If the first premise is just being applied to everyday objects, then it's extremely plausible. The evidence firmly rules that most objects cannot begin to exist without a cause. But that's not what the premise is saying. The premise claims that all objects that begin to exist must have a cause, including fundamental particles and, crucially, the universe as a whole. 
Does this claim stand up to scrutiny? Well, it's not clear that it's untrue. There isn't enough evidence to suggest that this premise is actually false, but there also isn't compelling evidence to suggest that it's true for absolutely everything. There aren't good reasons to think that it applies to the universe as a whole, which is a fundamentally different entity to the objects within it. There are also reasons to doubt that it applies to quantum particles, although this isn't clear cut. The problem here is that this argument is trying to apply the first premise to the universe as a whole, when there are no good reasons to believe that this is allowed. Let's conclude with a rating. The first premise of the cosmological argument, when applied to everyday objects, is a solid 9 out of 10, an extremely plausible premise. But when applied to extreme cases, like the universe as a whole, it's a mere 3 out of 10. It could apply, but there just aren't good enough reasons to think that it does. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for more analysis of the most common arguments for God's existence.